welcome everyone. How is everyone today? I hope we're all well. Um, this is the uh, Liquid Blake's movie takes, and today we'll be doing uh, Gross Point Blank, which is one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, it's never left my top five ever since first watching it, and it um, it's it's a really really fun uh, mix of genres. And um, I'll introduce, uh, I've got my guest with me today, uh, Lost Jedi 22. Uh, Hello! Uh, you're a big fan of this movie as well, I know. Oh, I'm a huge fan. I, God, this movie came out in 97. I remember going to see it multiple times in the theater. And I typically don't go to many movies more than once in the theater. This one I did. I absolutely like love the soundtrack. I think there are two versions of the soundtrack. I bought both of them, even though I had the songs, probably every single one of the songs on some other album or CD at the time, or in MP3 format. But I still bought them anyway because I just I love this movie so much. Oh yeah, and that and that is one of the um, the hallmarks of this movie is the uh, the music and the soundtrack and the way it's used. It. Um... It's just a classic blend because it did come out in the '90s, but it's a a movie about, or partly about a, a high school reunion from the '80s, and it does have a really good mix of both the '80s and the '90s in there. Of, um, yeah, right off the bat, I mean, you get right away. I think it's um, was it start off with Blister in the Sun or? Um, um, I can see clearly now the. the I can see clearly now, yeah. Yeah, for the for the opening crawl, yeah, and and as he's setting up his first. Um, uh, yeah, his first hit. Mm. Which is another thing about this movie. It's um, it's a hitman movie, but it's not one you'd really expect because it is a um, a, a, it's a very good mix of genres. It's the, it's a it's a really good mix of um, uh, a, a romantic comedy, also an action comedy, and just. For the most part, it is just a plain comedy because it is extremely funny. Um, it's a tough movie to classify. Like, if I would have to describe this movie, I would say that it's, and, and hear me out, it's a romantic comedy for guys. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I, I was, because I, I, I always say this is, it's very much a, um, it's a perfect sort of first date movie, I think. Like if, if you if you're on a yeah. and you're with someone and you and they don't and they haven't seen this movie before or even if they have really but it is a perfect movie to sort of um to to just sort of break the ice I guess yeah it's well it's fun again the soundtrack is is really great so that's always an easy thing um, for a date movie it has action in it but it's very limited there really isn't like I definitely wouldn't classify it as an action movie no. Um, there are action sequences in it yeah, and some gunplay. With action. Yeah, but it's pretty light on the action stuff. And, and, and it's more the dialogue and the character interactions. That make this Absolutely. That's, yeah, uh, uh, that's the other thing. The, to, the, for me, the, um, the, the three hallmarks of this movie are the... Um, we talked about the music but also mm -hmm. the, um, the character dynamics and the chemistry. And not just... Um, with like a few of the characters and it's mainly John Cusack. He has great chemistry and dynamics with every single co-star in this movie. Every John single Cusack. person in this movie, except for maybe the, the Felix La Poubelle, which is the, like the, the goon hit yeah. guy. He doesn't really ever talk to him. Everybody else. He has these incredible interactions with they're each different. They kind of have a banter and kind of a, and just, I would have loved to be on the set of filming this movie because honestly, I think they made it look pretty easy. Because oh, like Mini Mini Driver and and John Cusack have great natural chemistry. I think um, you, you definitely believe that those two were, um, you know, high school sweethearts at one time and are, are catching back up. I mean, it's great, but the dynamic between him and his therapist, Doctor Oatman, yes. I think steals the movie. I like absolutely. Oh my god! Like the, the the interactions between those two, I think, are the some of the most entertaining, funniest moments in the entire movie. Oh yeah. But then, 
him and Jeremy Piven's character, his friend um, from high school, his former teacher, yeah, his everyone. mom, just everybody he interacts with is just great. All the way down to um, even when he arrives at the um, at the reunion, the, the lady that's at the front desk handing out the badges, even he has like a little interaction yeah. with her. And that's is that Maria Aslas Joseph or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. That weird old lady. Yeah. That we all like we know one of those in high school. Like I that's the other thing too, is like high school, but yeah. Oh, oh you but poor dude, soul. I know I know guys like that, yeah. <laughs> you poor soul, all, all yeah. boys high school. Yeah. Um yeah, even even that, um uh what, what what's her name? We played Dharma. J Jenna Elfman? Yes, yeah. She's in this movie in a very small role. As a character who's like at the reunion and she like dumped her car in a lake and had a near death experience. So she's telling everybody at the reunion about how she like almost she saw the gates of heaven or whatever. Yeah. Like even that scene in the, in the way that Minnie Driver and John Cusack react to her telling the story. Because at first they're like, what, wait, what, what the hell are you saying? And then they figure it out like, oh, you almost died. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just great. Even small, like sort of um, minor characters like that, get a really great, um, fun sort of scene or interaction with the mains, or even just by themselves. And it's it goes throughout the whole movie. And, and, and yeah, the, the pen, the lawyer with the pen at the reunion, Ken. Yep. Uh, you know, thanks for the pen. Uh, like a nice little callback there. Yeah, the guy with the poem and. Um, oh the yeah, poem. Bobby Beamer. <laughs> um, Want to do some blow? It, yeah, it just goes through every and and yeah, the guy who's the um the security guard for like the the neighborhoods and goes around when Jeremy Piven oh god yeah into the houses they have the, uh, any interaction with him or oh, it it it's throughout the whole movie and I just want to say mm -hmm. so Stig says he's never seen this movie oh I man I think you'll really like it I think it's um it's a really fun movie and it's it's timeless like you can go back to it any time it doesn't really matter. And yeah, I mean, the only thing that really dates the movie for me is, you know, the the, the computer oh, yeah, that yeah. Grocer, Dan Aykroyd's character uses, mm. um, was like this green screen, like old monitor kind of setup, which was like outdated even for, for the 1997. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, um, you know, the cell phones, but like, you're always going to get that in any movies of that era. Yeah. Excellent work. Awesome, Steve. Like, what really, I can't under, I, like, <laughs> I can't understate this or overstate this. It's the character interactions in this movie that are just Absolutely. outstanding. And, 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 like, the dialogue and the back and forth. Mm. Um, and just and the, some of the attention to some of the details. Yes, yes. And that is my, that was what I was going to be as the third. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Movie, <laughs> oh, no. No, because I was just going to go through them sort of individually, but um, the the writing of this film and the dialogue, it is pretty much perfect for every character. Everyone has, as we we're saying, everyone has their own moment, has their own sort of um, uh, time in the spotlight, and mm -hmm. every single character is written, I think, genuinely and authentically. The only two that really, um, I think sort of go nowhere in the story are the two um, government agents. Like, they're, I think they're more just comedy add-on, sort of... Um, yeah, yeah, they're kind of generic dudes, but even even those two characters, though, I, there, there's a point, and in, in the, the point is, like, the, the government goons are basically, like, morally on the same level of professional assassins, or, or maybe even, like, a little worse. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot and, of messaging as well in this movie about that. Mm -hmm. Even just, and it's, and it's, the way that the dialogue is written, it is very fast paced. And a lot of those things, if you're not looking for them or like sort of paying attention and you're just in it for the, the comedy, it's sort of, it's sort of sub level a little bit because of the delivery and everything. But um, John Cusack has some um, great lines where he's, um, uh, likening what he does to sort of like what um governments do on a whole and and um private companies and all that sort of stuff and it is oh yeah the, the scene the scene where he's explaining himself self kind of to, to mini driver after he comes yeah. a, after the, the reunion yeah mm. that I, I really find that as a great 
there's a great little um, there's a great little caveat to the movie. And he absolutely does Apollo. Rhino does um, grow toenail seeds in Victoria. It's about the only thing that does grow there. But um, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll save that for another day. Hey, Tim. Tim um, and Timon, how are you guys? Thanks for being here. Uh, so yeah, uh, well, and yeah, I'll get back into the the character dynamics as well because one of the other great um, I mean, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that they would have great character dynamics, is um, John Cusack and his sister Joan Cusack in this movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. They have, and not just together, but she has some brilliant, uh, she does some brilliant work in this movie where she's um, she's having a conversation about the, the bullets that she ordered. And, and at the same <laughs> yeah. time, she's got someone on hold to, uh, talking about how she's going to be baking a cake or something. No, it's a uh, soup, soup. It's uh, yes. yeah, you know, and no, it's not going to be a soup. boring soup. The celery and the carrots are just the base of the soup. Yeah, and then she like flips back, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great stuff there. She was a little over the top, but it worked. Like yeah. I think, it, like it was, it wasn't like her trying to steal the scene or anything. It was like it, it fit her character. Yeah, absolutely. And you could tell she's kind of went with it. I've turned it up a little bit to mine and I moved the mic a bit closer. Hopefully that's a bit better. Um, yeah. And it's the change as well from when she's going from the, just the calm um, expl explaining of the, the recipe and just starts <laughs> flip and, and puts them on hold and just um, absolutely flies off the handle at this person who she has ordered the, uh, the bullets and the round off. Um, mm -hmm. Which all ends up being for Nord anyway, because over the next um, parts of the movie, she ends up uh, dismantling the office anyway and taking it all apart. So it is pretty funny. Well, see, so what they do is the side business, and there's they they mention it a couple times in the movie because there's there's some dialogue between Grocer and and Martin Blank um, about he like you took a bath on some tanks or something like that that. Like yeah, the T thirty. So so they get their money doing their hits, but then they're also basically arms dealer, international arms dealers as well. Yeah. And like, I don't think any of them actually like warehouse their stuff. They're just like a go between. Oh yeah, absolutely yeah. So when she's taking down the office and everything, like I don't think that you know, like there was a bunch of bullets that were about to go off or anything like oh, that. Oh no but... no no, I don't I don't mean that. <laughs> I just think it's um like the business is basically over anyway. So like. Everything she's yeah. working for him that day, it's not gonna really gonna matter anyway. But the one and she ended up with a nice little bonus too. Yeah, but I mean, lucky he called at that time because this, that's the one thing. Like she's um, pouring petrol or gasoline all over the office. If she mm -hmm. just if he had a call a bit later and she'd already lit the match and he's like, oh, check under the desk for the money. They're just like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that would have been that unfortunate. Might, huh? Yeah, that might be gone. I'll, <laughs> I'll check if my volume's down too low. I'll put that up a bit. Is that any better for guys? For anyone out there? Hopefully that's a bit better. I put it up a bit. Um, but yeah. You might you might want to see if you can boost your, your own mic and stream yards as well. That might be a, an option. But yeah, see, Martin has this weird dynamic between himself and like with his with his office assistant. It's played by his sister, Joan Cusack. And yeah. and Doctor Oatman, is it they they like work for him and they like, but they also f are scared to death of him. Like so, the first time you're introduced to Joan's character, she's like really nervous around him, like, and and the, their their interaction is very awkward. Like he comes into the office, and he's just. He's like, no, I'm going to go in there. And then she's kind of waiting and she's kind of like, she's like on eggshells kind of around him and very like almost afraid of him. And like when she's taking him in the office, he says like, you know, go basically go ahead and do it. I'll, I'll come find you. And she like almost panics a little bit. And she's like, w w why? And he's like, no, it's not like that. And that's when he tells her there's money under the, the desk. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like she has this right. like weird unhealthy fear well healthy fear i guess because of what he does for a living yeah and the same with dr Oaten. that's the first thing she assumes is he's, he's he's like she's like what 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 do you mean about yeah him? tie up loose ends right yeah you know that would be a logical assumption like that's like oh yeah that's not being irrational that's a pretty logical assumption like you work for a hitman 
and he's basically going out of business and retiring, you're a loose end. Oh yeah, it's like the um, the constant fear that the uh, the psychiatrist has of uh, Mark. Oh every, yeah, he's scared every to death time. of death. And, <laughs> and these, uh, for, from the very first time I saw the movie, these were some of my favorite interactions in the movie. Martin with his um, his psychiatrist in the office, and also the phone calls that he he makes to him as he's in um, Detroit for the reunion. But mm -hmm. Alan Arkin does an amazing job of. Um, Oh, really, he's perfect. Yeah, really selling the... Um, he, he just wants this guy out of his office. He's just trying to tell him anything he can. Just please leave as soon as you can. And don't come back, basically. Mm. Yeah, he's he's scared to death of him. He can't, he can't treat him the way he's supposed to treat him. No. Um, because he's emotionally involved, he tells Martin this, and and it's still like it doesn't matter because like how many how many psychiatrists can he if you're in his shoes can he go to and be honest with before mm -hmm. eventually like one of them turns him in. So it's not like he can go shopping around for a bunch of psychiatrists. So yeah, I know it's 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 really um sorry is, I think my, maybe my something's wrong with my mic. I don't know. I've turned the gain up. Maybe that's a bit better. And, um, and it sounds the same. Um, check your StreamYard settings. So go in your cam mic settings. Yeah, I've turned it all the way up to two hundred now. And it's um, yeah, it's only it's not really going much past the second. Yeah, I'll turn cancellation on. See if that does anything. Maybe that makes it a little bit. Yeah, that's that's putting the levels up a bit. So yep. sorry about that, guys. I think that might be a bit better. Um, yeah, you're definitely coming in stronger now. Cool, thanks. So, um, yeah. So, the, yeah, the, I'll just, we'll just summarize a bit. So the, the three things that I've really found are the hallmarks of this movie are the, the music, the writing, and the character chemistry and dynamics. And all three of them play perfectly well together. It's also a, a really uh, well-casted movie. It's like... Um, it's it's almost like I was talking about in the last stream I did about Predator. I, I think that is a perfectly cast movie. And this, on the exact same level, I think every cast member brings their A game and every cast member has something meaningful to do to the story. And it all fits together extremely well. And uh, Stig was saying before he hasn't seen the movie, um, if you haven't seen this movie, it is a timeless one to go back and watch. Like, there's techni uh, technology issues and stuff, as was saying, as Greg was saying before. But um, very few, though. I mean, not a yeah, whole lot. It doesn't really dwell on that in the movie, and it, it, it doesn't. Before. The movie doesn't center around the tech, so it's yeah. just you notice it is, it's like, well, yeah. that's an old phone. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very much a character and story driven movie, and you can go back to watch it now. In ten years' time, I think I don't think it'll lose anything. To be honest, I think it. But that is one thing um, because I, I didn't see this movie in the theaters. I saw this movie for the first time uh, on VHS from the video store, and mm. I had no idea what this movie was. I had no. Um, I don't. I don't even think I'd seen like a trailer or anything on like uh, other VHS to rent like. Uh, um, promoting upcoming uh, rentals. But this movie, I remember I watched it for the first time and I immediately uh, rewound it, which, yep, back in the day you had to rewind the movies. <laughs> Please be kind and, and rewind. Yeah. And I, I watched it uh, straight away all, uh, all over again. And it was um, it was just as just as good as watching it the first time. And it's never really lost any, any of that um, magic for me. Because uh, I do, I do like to say that movies uh, should be fun, and I think this movie exemplifies fun in a great way. And it doesn't, it's, it doesn't, it's not really the subject matter or the um, the story or anything. It is just the the level of um, enjoyment you, saw, you 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 see through the actors. I think, and that's what Greg was saying before. You'd love to be on the set for this movie. To just to see like some of the stories and and how this his came together, because um, that's one thing I will say that on the um, the physical copy, especially this Australian version, there is absolutely zero 
special features, like no little making of. There's not even a trailer on there. So, no, they weren't going to put money. See, the movie only did like thirty-one, thirty-two million dollars. Well, yeah, that's what I was I was going to look up now as well as the. Um, it didn't do well. No. I mean, but the, in the '90s, like you could still make money with a with a movie that did that kind of dollar amount. Yeah, on the secondary market. Yeah. Well, on the secondary market, plus you know, actors weren't commanding the paydays. Very, yeah. very few actors were commanding the paydays. Yeah, I didn't that they I that they do now. I'm not sure if hmm? it's listing it here. I'm not sure if it's listing it here, but the um. It doesn't really say what the um, budget was for the movie. Uh, let me see. I thought I had it up on a tab here. Uh, $15 million, uh, and this is according to the numbers. Yeah. .com. So, yeah. So, it's... instead of it, worldwide box office, is a little over $31 million on a budget of fifteen. So... Did two and a half times its production budget, which yeah. isn't it's, it's, great. No, but it's had a pretty considering good life. it's such a low budget movie. No, but it has had a pretty good life on um, DVD and, and the secondary market. I think so. I think so. Um, and then yeah, the soundtrack sold extremely well. So. Oh yeah. With That's I fun. mean, soundtrack a lot of that goes to the artists, but mm. still, I mean, yeah. most of it goes to the artists. But yeah, that the. Um, it's it's one of those ones where I, I, I wish they would do a, a some sort of special edition like four K or, or just even a Blu ray or something, update it now and just um even get some like a some cast a re, commentary or something. Yeah, a reunion of itself. Yeah. Like they, they the cast come back and do something. Oh actually that is one thing I wanted to say. Um I'll just find it again. But there is um Something coming up in maybe September, I think it was. It's a um, a screening of the movie with uh, John Cusack in Detroit. Oh, really? Yeah, in Detroit. And then, it, yeah, and there's a, a Q and A afterwards. Um, I can't find it right now, but I'll I'll make sure to um to put the link in the um. In the, either the description or it, um, I'll tweet it out anyway. But uh, yeah, that that would be great to go to. Because that would be interesting. John Cusack is a, an, an interesting fella. Yes, I actually um, when he's I tweeted this out, he's a little kooky. Yeah, when I tweeted this out today on my timeline, it came up, and the very tweet below it was actually John Cusack going off about something to do with the U.S. government or something. It was. He's a bit of a conspiracy kook. Um, yeah. it, it comes through a little bit in this movie. Um, yeah, well, that's what I, yeah, well, I touched on a little bit before. I'm not sure if anyone heard or not, but there is some lines where he very much, there is a lot of likening what the hitmen do in this movie to like government work and, and that sort of thing. And, oh, the idea that there's, you know, some global cabal and, you know, yeah. uh, it, I think a line in the movie is the ideas of, like, nations, borders and everything is just PR anyway. Mm. Uh, I think is, is something he says to 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 Debbie, um, which is Minnie Driver's character. But Yeah. It's, so, it's something to that effect. So Yeah, there's a lot of little ones just like that just sort of slid in there under the door. Mm -hmm. you, sort of, you sort of almost miss them the first time. But it is um, well. See, and that's if you're gonna do commentary in a movie, like pay pay attention, Hollywood. Like you can you can you can throw your own little jabs and stuff in there without it being like so stupidly like obvious. Like look directly into the camera and like yeah. do your talking point, yeah. which I think yeah. is like really what's the most offensive thing about Hollywood these days is not that like because there's been agendas in movies forever, right? Oh, it, yeah. It's just now it's so overt and it's. And it's not just like, here's the message we want you to know. It's like, here's the message, and if you don't believe in it, you're an awful person. Yeah, pretty much. It's it's um, if you don't agree, right? Yeah, if you don't agree, you're you're the walking devil. Yeah. And, and you know that's that's not exactly a great way to win over people to your cause. It more yeah. often than not causes people to kind of dig in their heels. Yeah, 
and and there used to be a lot more um actual uh points of view in movies like not everyone had the same point of view and it was okay to have characters who didn't agree and everything instead of just everyone for the exact same common cause or, or whatever you want to call it right it's sort of as you get today it's it is very overt and very in your face and not just in the movies it's it's how they market them now pretty much it that's is the that's the selling point of the movie instead of the actual movie itself unfortunately this this movie is not one of those there there are there are some hints of some po- political leanings and some you know maybe a, even a little bit of conspiracy theory stuff in there but it's mm-hmm. it's so quick like I I noticed it because I've seen the movie like a thousand times. So yeah, well, and it completely <laughs> it completely fits the character as well of where Martin Blank has sort of come from. How he was um, re- uh, recruited um, from the yeah. very young in the military into like those sort of CIA ghost programs, and then branched off into his own work and everything. Like that's he how was, he became a hitman. So like he he yeah. went through that whole. Mm. The, the whole thing, and then you have the NSA guys, uh, one of them is Hank Azaria. Yeah. <laughs> who's actually pretty, I mean, those guys are, they're actually kind of funny in, yeah. in the movie, along with gro- their interactions with the grocer, which is Dan Aykroyd's character. Um, mm. Very, very funny. But yeah, that's that's his worldview is from that from that life. You know, yeah. CIA, NSA manipulating things and, you know, taking people yeah. out. And there is that moment he, he talks about in the movie where he, he has, has this sort of epiphany He's um, climbing over sand dunes in the Gulf or something, and he he just looks. Yeah. And the, the ocean was on fire, and he's like, mm-hmm. he just like, whoa, and it's like, yeah, this guy's seen some things. But that's yeah. um He learns so much about his character. Yes. Through through dialogue, and it's not expositional dialogue. No, a lot of it's like also thrown in with jokes. And he's he's sort of right. half, you think he's half joking, especially to the people like when he's telling them um, he's. Oh yeah, he them. tells everybody that he's hit. Yeah. No, just nobody believes him. They all think like, yeah. aha, that's funny. Mm. They ask him things like, oh, do you get dental with that, or hey, do you have to do post grad work for that? Mm. And, and it's like, ah, oh, no, it's an open market, no dental. Yeah, you know, everybody everybody thinks it's a off. joke, and then including Minnie Driver's character until she finds out that it wasn't. He's like, people joke about the things that they don't do they don't actually do them yeah exactly <laughs> there is some absolutely and that is the thing as well it's that's a very good um dichotomy of the points of view of those two characters in this movie yeah like she asked him, like how come you never learned it was wrong yeah yeah they are like, what's wrong different. with you and you know there's one of my favorite scenes right? <laughs> i can jump around and talk about this movie all day long there's a scene like you understand it, it's a it's a very small scene. I don't think there's any dialogue in it whatsoever. It's right after he goes to see his mom. And he finds yeah. out that his mom has basically been put into the loony bin. Yeah. She's in a she's in a nice home because she's taking lithium. And yeah. like you don't understand like how a guy like becomes an assassin or has that moral flexibility, as he says. And like what happened to the mother? And it's just a scene where he goes to visit his dad's gravesite and he yeah. dumps a bottle of booze hmm. on his on his dad's grave. Yeah. Just empties the whole bottle and chucks the bottle on it. Yeah. You didn't there was no dialogue in there saying that he was an abusive father or an no, alcoholic. Word. Yeah. You just you just knew from that very short scene that's what you know, that's what kind of Correct. fucked him up. That's what caused him to like leave and join uh, the army in the first place. Yeah, and it, it, it's just it. That's a that's a great example of show don't tell. Yeah, exactly, and it, it because you great, can take um, so much from that. Just and it's like it's a minute, two minutes of runtime, maybe to dump the bottle out, and it starts yeah. playing that Guns and Roses "Live and Let Live and Let Die" song, and then it, then he's off to the Ultimart, which is another. The first Altamart scene was pretty good. I didn't like the second. Oh, the the first one is, and it's it's his reaction as well when he he arrives and yeah, what are you doing here? What, who are you? Yeah, 
It's like harassing yeah. that poor clerk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who are you? What 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 are you doing here? Like what yeah, he's just work here. Where's your manager? How Where do you live? Here? Where does he yeah. live? <laughs> I'm not I'm telling, telling you that. that. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's see, yeah. And there's sort of a little subtle hitman mode. Yeah, there's a little subtle thing that they do. And like I know other movies have done it, but like this one it really just stood out. Is Live and Let Die is playing pretty strong. It's like the volume's up on the song on the soundtrack. I, um, I know exactly what you go with this, yeah. And as soon as he walks into the convenience store, it switches over in the exact same beat, it switches over to the Muzak version. Yep. Which is I thought it was like, did they just switch that to the music? Perfect. It is. I thought like what a what a tiny little neat detail to, yeah. to get. It it and it, it just proves how perfect the music is in this movie and how not just how like the the song selection or anything like that, it's how it's implemented as well. Every mm-hmm. scene almost feels like because I, I sometimes do clips or I've done clips for a couple of the streams I've done of the movie, but it was near impossible to get a clip of this movie without copyright move music playing at some stage in the clip over it yep yep and it's it it's wall to wall but it, it works so much because um uh, uh debbie's character works at a radio station so um mm-hmm. basically throughout one of the whole entire scenes where they first um meet each other again he goes to visit her there's she's yeah, that got music great. playing in the background and then um she even puts him on air and starts going through his problems and he's freaking out. He just doesn't want anything to do with it. And, um, and then you see like, he's sort of his training and stuff kick in. Like she gets up and he, he goes and takes the chair that's facing the door and the window. So he can see anyone that's coming. Yeah. And, Cause he has um, high anxiety. If his, like yeah. his back is to the, the, the door. So mm-hmm. and you see that in the restaurant, you see it in, in the, the DJ booth, I think are the, the two main ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. I mean, like, she's doing it like she's doing. So it, they're they're class of nineteen eighty six. So these yeah. these guys are you know graduated high school, middle of the eighties. It's now their ten year reunion, which lines up pretty close to the release date of the movie, nineteen ninety seven. Pretty close. Yeah. Um, and so she works at the 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 radio station, and yeah, she's doing an all eighties all vinyl weekend. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you hear, like, the clash. And then, like, when he first comes into the booth, it, like, she's, like, stunned. And she's just like, and here's the specials doing one of their songs. <laughs> yeah. Because it, 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 um, it is the first time he's been back in, in 10 years. And, like... Um, yeah, since he stood her up. Yeah, that's on, the other thing you find night. out in that scene. Yeah. It's like, he probably, like, he couldn't have le- uh, left under worse circumstances with her pretty much yeah like he um he just basically took off and left on the uh like one of the the keystone uh, cornerstone nights of the high school um calendar and um yeah he, you know a, a room a key romantic night and you know it's it's you know teenage girls you know princess it's ball not really party. a thing we have here but yeah it's i mean watching so I don't many think American it's as big thing as it used to be anyway but yeah oh yeah probably probably not yeah um but yeah watching American movies I mean everyone I think in the world knows what like the, oh there's the always the prom, the, the, and... the prom the yeah, yeah the prom scene always the prom scene in the movies especially yeah teen teen comedies and stuff like that oh yeah so but yeah I mean are... like we haven't even really discussed like the plot is actually very so the writing is like twofold for me there, there, there's mm-hmm. two separate things in the writing. The the character dynamics and their interactions, spot on. Yep. The actual story itself, pretty pretty simple. There's not there's not there's no subverting expectations, no you know, it, it's not a very nuanced plot. It, there's not a mystery that to figure out. It, it's no. pretty much a straightforward tale. Mm-hmm. Um Basically about a guy kind of like refining himself because he's burnt out as a as a hitman. He's not yeah. happy doing what he's doing. He has reoccurring dreams of of Mini Driver's character, uh, Debbie. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just restless. He's having you know work issues and like he had a couple 
um, jobs that didn't go well. Yeah, the start of the uh, year. And he's, he's just, yeah, he's in a bad spot. He's like in midlife crisis. And like, this is, he, he goes back and kind of like reconnects with his, his older, his old life and meets, you know, rehooks up with his, with his high school sweetheart. And, you know, and there's a little action thing cause there's supposed to be, uh, um, a job that happens to be in town where he's going to the reunion. Yeah. But it, it's really just, it, it's a very simple, simple story. It, it's nothing, nothing monumental, but like it doesn't have to be this overcomplicated twist and turn um, plot thing to be a good movie. And it, yeah. especially when you nail the dialogue and the characters. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's two of the biggest steps to getting like, a, a likable um, chemistry and a likable um, result on screen is um, everything they do in this movie. The story is so simple but so well done that mm-hmm. it's it's like it's um, it just it just sort of just effortlessly flows from start to finish, and there is yeah. no real. I mean, there's there's so there's sort of like two two to three like action sequences you you kind of call them in the movie there's like the the ultimate um shootout mm-hmm. there's the high school um uh hand to hand fight and then there's yep. the shootout at the end and mm-hmm. all of them like you can you can tell like this this what we look we um we saw before it, it wasn't a, a high budget movie but no. The choreography and everything in the action sequences for a mainly a comedy movie is so well done and and, and fits the story so well that Ooh, every I'm, aspect. I'm going to disagree. You don't, which part? One of my nitpicks, and this is a nitpick with, with this movie, and, and like I, one thing I wish they would have done better is like when you watch this movie, um, they would have very much benefited from having the actors go through a little bit of gun training. Oh uh, yeah. And, yeah, okay. and there's, and it's not just that it's, and I, I don't know why it's baffling me, but I catch it every time I see the movie, um, particularly in the ultimate scene, but sometimes in the, in the final sequence as well, there's some spots where like the gun and the muzzle flashes just aren't lined up. Right. Like he's shooting and like, one of his guns won't do a muzzle flash, but one will. And he's shooting both of them. You can tell he's shooting both of them. Yeah. One has a muzzle, the muzzle flash. The other one doesn't for some reason. And the sound timing just seems to be like, just off. Like it just isn't synced quite right with the action. So like they could have benefited from having uh, somebody who is a little bit more experienced in, in that part of it. Like I, the way they handle the guns is fine. Like I didn't have anything like it didn't nothing jumped out at me that was like, oh my god, this guy, how can he be an assassin who doesn't even know how to hold the weapon? It's just in those action sequences, the 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 firing of the guns with the muzzle flashes and the sound was just off. Like it was just yeah. a a beat or two late okay. with the sound and then the muzzle flashes were inconsistent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean I can almost excuse it for the Budget, the budget, and everything. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Even in that time, that's a that's a low budget, and I think a lot of that probably would have gone mm-hmm. to um, cast. Because... Well, actually, I think I think the cast probably came pretty cheap. Um, okay, because I think like John probably didn't take much of an actor because um, no. he's I think a producer on this thing. Yeah. So I'm going to guess he didn't take a big salary as an actor for it, even though he's a lead. And he casts a lot of the same. He's kind of, he's not like Adam Sandler, but he does cast a lot of people in his close sphere. In yeah. you see his projects. Pop up in a lot of his movies. Uh, you know, two of his sisters are in this movie. Um, yeah, Joan and uh, I think Anne are both in this movie. She's um, the, the drunk. Yeah, the she's the one that the drunk in the hip, the hippo bar or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Where he says like he sells biscuits and gravy all across the hot <laughs> Southland from yeah, yeah that's another one of them. It's just 
chemistry with everyone in the movie. Like she, yeah. like she's just a, a minor character, and he has these like perfect little like one-liners with her and everything, and mm-hmm. it just all goes together to make um to make this movie flow so well. Yeah, but, yeah uh, he's I done can, multiple things with the... Jeremy Piven. Um, yeah. You know, going Is all he... the way back, Crazy Summer, Mini Driver. Um, Have you done anything else with Mini Driver? I don't think Mini Driver probably, but she wasn't like a she wasn't a star. Like no. she's had two really kind of big roles, and then kind of does some smaller stuff, and really never really broke it in Hollywood. I don't know if she's like busy in the stage in England. I mean, she's she's British, yeah. Um, and she does she does an American accent pretty damn well, really um, well. Because you don't I didn't, you don't I get didn't a, realize you don't, the first time I saw it. Yeah, you don't have no idea. Like it, it doesn't sneak through really at all. Um, in, in this in this movie anyway, I okay. She was she was the, the a horrible singer in one of the Bond movies, Goldeneye, and she was the girlfriend in um the uh, Matt Damon uh, Good Will Hunting. Yes, that's yeah, and that's about it as as far as like big big titles go. So like, I don't think she would have commanded much of a a, a salary. Yeah, and and being British as well, I mean they um, they sort of they they come a little bit cheaper as well. The uh, the foreign well, because you know it's a chance to break different. through to Hollywood, yeah, right? So exactly. you, you kind of take a discounted rate just to, to get your foot in the door. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to be in this. I'm going to be in a John Cusack movie. Because remember, like John Cusack had been <clears throat> headlining movies since since the eighties. <laughs> I you oh, know yeah. like I, I've been a fan of his his movie work since. You know, again, one crazy summer, better off dead, hot pursuit, uh, say anything like all those eighties movies. Yeah, um, he, had, he had a great run in the eighties and the nineties. Like, was mm-hmm. this was like a year a year apart from Con Air, I think, as well. Like he had a yeah. I mean, I mean, it was a smaller role in Con Air, but then I think mm-hmm. he went on to do like High Fidelity as well, um, yeah. which is a good movie. Um, and then he had that sort of romantic comedy run in like the early two thousand sort of um, yeah serendipity with uh, what's in it keep back in Seattle and yeah I could look yeah. at her all day. <laughs> he did a, a a one which it kind of reminded me a little bit of um, this movie. I think it was maybe ten years ago. I think it was co- the called the Numbers Station. That was one I mm. I didn't mind, and it um it was sort of like a little bit of a throwback to this one, but it was very much a a really low budget sort of hitman movie. It, it sort of only takes place in um, one sort of compound, but it's um, it was one I, I kind of enjoyed as well. Yep, I he was in Sixteen started. Candles as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, he just um, he was also. I think he was the he was the brother in Stand by Me. Uh, Will Wheaton's brother who died. He wasn't the one that was by the tracks, but he was. He had a very very small role in Stand by Me as well. Yeah, I, that's one I haven't I have not seen probably since I was a kid. I don't think Stand by Me. It's been a long time since I've seen that movie. Mm-hmm. I just remember like, oh my god, that's John Cusack. Yeah, it's always good when you go back as well and you and you see people in the movie like that. You're like, oh, that's a a really young like Nicolas Cage or um, Bill Paxton or something, and you're like, oh wow. Well, you uh, go back to a movie like that one, and you're like, mm-hmm. holy crap. <laughs> like that, I mean, that was before a lot of those guys kind of went on to like you know become you know pretty big stars. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Kiefer is in that one, obviously. Uh, you know, Will Smith and you know, fucking Will Wheaton. <laughs> uh, fucking Will Wheaton. Yeah. Um, fucking Wesley Crusher. Yeah. Um, that, I think uh, the only thing I've ever it? seen him in Jerry was, O'Connell. Uh, um, yes, Jerry. He was always the uh, he was like in so many of those, and then you see him grown up, and you're like, that's not the same that was, person. Yeah, that was the that was the fat kid in the eighties. What the hell? Yeah, yeah. I remember because uh, I think the first time I'd seen him again <laughs> after a long time was Scream Two, and I was like, that's that's that kid. What? And that was a, that was a trip. But um, I, he was in actually a, a show I really used to like called uh, My Secret Identity. Which was just like mm. a random sort of afternoon show, I think. But yeah, there was um, a lot of a lot of great movies that sort of um, John Cusack all through the eighties and the nineties. Like he had a really good run. He did. He, he he did. And I think yeah, I think he does. He doesn't do as much now, but I think he is sort of more. 
That's like 55 years old. Like, yeah. his bread and butter, like, he, he started off being the, you know, the, the teenager in, in all those movies, right? Going all the way up, in, you know, in, in, into some romantic comedies like Say Anything, um, which is a brilliant movie if you've never seen that one. I, I, that one I recommend. Long, long time ago. I mean, that one's like, you need to you need to see that movie so you understand the whole boombox meme. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because that, that's where it comes from, is that movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, standing, you know, playing like, what was it, In Your Eyes on the, on the big-ass boombox outside her bedroom window. Um, yeah, that's another that thing. Classic, like. That classic scene that's been parodied like 10 billion times in other movies yeah. now. You just tell everyone it's a giant iPod or something. Yeah, well, hey, I, I remember what I remember what a boombox was. I like, I'm not, um, I'm not as, I'm definitely younger <laughs> than John Cusack. So when this movie came out, I was only uh, a few years out of high school. So yeah, um, not ten, but no. I still got a lot of it because like, it, it. I don't know. This movie just made a lot of sense to me. Like, I really dug the characters, the dynamics, like you know that that guard guy, right? He's at the he's at the he's at the reunion, and one of his big gripes is he's like he's all pissed off because he's like, you know, these fucking people they got like blue stars on their badge because they're in, her, in honor society like, like that makes like any bit of difference today that you were in the honor society ten years ago like and he's like shows him his gun he's like whoa Jesus Christ I love that scene just the reaction yeah. it, it, it's just how he pulls it out like he's just like yeah. manic toy man he just goes and then just puts it straight back down again yeah. Oh. Yeah, that whole that whole reunion thing. There's like attention to detail. There's 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 a scene where he he bumps into Jeremy Piven's character, and I can't remember the character's name. Um, uh, Paul. 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 Yeah. Paul. Paul. Something like you know, something. he was he was the nerdy guy in high school, and you find this out through the dialogue because. They're talking, and then this this blonde comes up, and it's like uh, Jenny Slater, I think is her name. She yeah. was obviously like the the hot girl in high school, and she still looked pretty pretty good at the reunion, right? Yeah. And he's like, she's like, oh hey Martin. She like remembers Martin Blank, but like completely like ignores Paula. Yeah. And he's like, hi hi Jenny Slater, hi Jenny Slater, hi Jenny Slater, hi Jenny Slater, right? And then she's like, he like points to his thing, Paul, like. We had like eleven classes together. Like you don't remember me, and she's like, yeah. "Oh, yeah." The, the reaction is hilarious. But and then later, like, yeah. But then later in these like pulled back shots of them, the dancing, mm -hmm. he's dancing with her, like in yeah. two different things. Like he's getting further and further along because Bobby Beamer tried and she like pushed him away. They show that yeah. in like a pulled back shot. I think when they're like sitting in the balcony and they're talking, which there's a great conversation that that um, Martin and Debbie have in 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 the in the the upper seats, I guess, in the gymnasium or whatever, the yeah. wherever they're holding. I think it was yeah, basically the the gym. Um, they're having this conversation and they show the the thing, and then he's dancing with her, and like you can see, like he, he's kind of like progressing along or, or just falling basically into his old habits of just basically just running straight at her. Yeah. I need it to just, be... again, a little detail. Like you didn't need to bring Jeremy Piven in to do that scene. You could have had any extra or whatever, but like, no, they had him doing it. Cause it was like, Oh yeah, he's, he's into Jenny, you know, Jenny Slayer. Yeah. And there's like a kind of might, maybe like a little bit of a hint that uh, Paul may have actually gone out and done a little bit of a uh, blow with um, Bobby Beamer because he's a little bit, hyped for a lot of the um the reunion uh jeremy piven he, um, yeah they're very high strung i think they're but so is martin and so is debbie though they're all mm -hmm. like just like they they, they want to go to this reunion but it's like oh my god they, they have such anxiety because they're just like uh who, who are these people i don't want to meet like they're they're just like they're looking forward to it and dreading it at the same time yeah but yeah, and maybe he, he did. He, he certainly didn't have. Uh, he didn't go have a have a smoke with uh, the wrestler guy. No, no. He offered no. to go outside and do you know have some have, have a joint. Yeah, that was the other like. And there is so many little um, interactions at the at the reunion that they all go through. Mm. Um, and there is there is the, the story that we we're saying before with Jenna Elfman and her um, near death experience. 
And yes. There's, yeah. And there's like a uh, Martin where he sort of um, has another sort of epiphany moment where he he sees the uh, one of his older old friend um, and she's got the the baby there and he holds yeah the baby. little baby Robbie. Yeah. And that's that was a cute. that was a that was a cute scene. Like yeah. I'm generally not into cutesy stuff, but like when he's holding Robbie and and the and the baby's making faces, and then it cuts to his face, and he's kind of like looking puzzled, and and the kids just making all these like adorable, cute kid faces back at him. Yeah, and he, he's just like he's getting some sort of deep meaning from it or something. Like, yeah, oh, because. She says something important to him, this friend, because he's like, oh, you know, got married. And it's like, oh, is it as bad as, as they say it is? And she's like, oh, no, it's great. Mm. Like, no, it, this is really, this is great. I, I, I love being married. I love having a family. And yeah. that kind of like disarmed him a little bit because he's very cynical. He's very... Yeah, and, and it, it because of his own right. background and everything, and yeah, it was like a perception change for him. Mm -hmm. And he he got this kind of thing because he, he's rekindling his 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 thing with Debbie, and at the same time he's seeing this other like, like oh yeah, like just living a normal life, having a family and everything. It's it's not this restrictive handcuffing thing that he thinks it it is. Yeah, it's actually. You know, he's seeing these other people, and it's liberating. Yeah, and and he's kind of like he's getting like, I can leave the life I'm living now and go do this, and like it's not going to be torture. I'm not going to feel tied down and anchored and weighed. Like it could be, this could be really great. And that that scene where he's going back, you know, the, with the kid, the kid's face, then his face, the kid's face, and his face as just that was great. Yeah, and that um. A transformational moment for the character. Absolutely, like he, um, and and also um, uh, Debbie witnesses that interaction as well, and it's sort of oh um, yeah, that's that's a panty dropper right there, you know, playing yeah. with the kid. And it brings her back around <laughs> because she, you kind of feel like she's kind of a little bit on the fence still about about Martin, but then as the reunion goes on, like um, they they really sort of start to uh, click back together and everything. Until yeah, yeah, an event happens. We'll, we'll get to that yeah. in the um, in the balcony scene. She says to him, "It's like you know, on the radio, I was harsh. Like I, I, you know, I don't think you're broken. You're just mildly sprained. Nothing that can't be fixed." Yeah, and which was kind of her kind of saying, like, you know, I was that I wasn't being fair. Like, there's something wrong with you, but like there's still you there. There's still good in you. It was almost yeah. kind, of, kind of one of those things. And that was a touching moment. And then he says something like the, the conversation continues. And then he goes like, well, you know, I'm sorry. I fucked up your life, you know, because he did leave her on prom night, just stood her up and disappeared. And, you know, she, she admits to him, like, I didn't know what, like, was there something I did to push you away or anything like that? And he was like, no, no, no. And he goes, I'm sorry I fucked up your life. And she looks at him and she goes, yeah, well, it's not over yet. Yeah. Yeah, they both get I just, I, I like that. I, I love I love that line in that movie because it's just like, like, life is, it, it's it's ongoing. It's, it's not, it's not past tense. Like, this can be fixed. I, I still have a life to live. I can still, I can still live a happy life. And that was for her moment. It was her little bit of shakabuku, <laughs> which is so, a word uh, that she says is a swift spiritual kick in the head that alters your perception forever. Yeah, very, um, very new age for the time. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, and and so, uh, this this movie is great, not formulaic. Uh, Cusack had really hit his stride at this point in his career. Absolutely, um, mm -hmm. this was this was in a great run of his um, his sort of uh, I guess you'd sort of sort of his, his middle to later career, I guess. Yeah, a but little yeah. bit of a career renaissance because yeah. I think in the early nineties he wasn't doing much, and then he had a bit of a career renaissance. Um, 
because because he had to like move on from being the 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 teenager in the movie and and, yeah, and take on some more adult roles. I just want to go back to that other that 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 scene. The song that's playing in that background of that that whole scene that we're discussing is "Let My Love Open the Door." Yeah, and it, it, it's so perfect. perfect song for what's going on in that. It's a good song too. I mean, you know, yeah. it's certainly not like a heavy metal song or anything. It's not a dance song or anything. I mean, it's a slow dance song, I guess. But um, perfect, perfect song choice for what's going on in the movie at that time. Well yeah. thought out, and, that, and that's I think that's when they go down to. Uh, actually st- start dancing on the dance floor, I think, is it? Or is this after the dance? No, then, uh, yeah, they, they go down, um, they end that conversation, and she's like, well, do you want to dance? And he's yeah. like, yeah. And that's when they go down to the dance floor. Yeah. And then from the dance floor, they go to the nur- nurse's office. Yeah, it takes a little bit of a detour to the nurse's office, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, I think she uh, checked his temperature. And, yeah, um, yeah. Fortunately, um, he, he was very healthy. Yeah. yeah but there's so a great moment very... in that too, where where she's like, "Wait, wait, something's missing," and then she like <laughs> slaps him like really hard. Yeah, because you think and he kind of he like he's like, <sighs> and then he grins and he's like, he smiles as he's like starts kissing her again. And it's like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah, and I mean, you you sort of like um, she had to sort of get a little bit of. Um, sort of revenging, I guess, for uh, everything. Yeah, a, a, a little bit of like, you know, like what you did was still wrong, but like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I forgive you, but this, and, and a little bit of a callback, like it was, it was almost like, this isn't right. It doesn't feel like it did back then. Oh yeah. It's because you were, you were being too fresh and I had to slap you. <laughs> and and yeah. then you had your way with me anyway. You know, it was like, it was very, it was like a very, very callback to uh, high school relationships. Yeah. I guess. And uh, the um, yeah, so the and that it is that's sort of like the um, very much the um, dramatic romantic um, comedy part of the movie, and then that sort of um, mm-hmm. uh, it kicks into a little bit of action here, where he gets confronted by um, one of the uh, people yeah. who is uh, in in the town, Felix sort of La Poubelle. yeah, pursuing him, the um, the trained assassin who. Uh, from Basque or the Basque assassin or something. And yeah. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> he has a, he has a contract on his life, even though he's an mm-hmm. assassin because his, uh, on a, on a previous, um, job, he inadvertently caused the prize hunting dog to die. Yeah. Boudreaux. It, Boudreaux. And it's something that, um, grocer who we haven't really talked about like at all. No, um, and he's their interactions are great too, but uh, Boudreaux, like he ends up dying, and that's why he has a contract on his life. This, this rich guy liked his dog, and so he put a hit on because he blames Martin for for killing his dog. Yeah, and I, I do really like attacked. the uh, yeah, I do really like the choreography in this scene. It's um, you can tell like John Cusack, he's not really like a trained martial artist or anything, but he does a well, he, sort of he's a kickboxer. Job. And well, yeah, um, I mean, but I mean, like he's not like a, a government assassin sort of like, right, trained. right. Yeah, um, he, he, but he does a very admirable job of getting through it. And they both sort of, um, I think, because I think the little guy is a stuntman. Like, I don't know if he's like a, an actual sort of full the little actor. guy is actually, like, I think, his personal trainer. Oh, okay, John well, Cusack. Makes- if I rem- if I remember back, if I remember correctly. That makes it's, a bit more sense as It's well. his personal trainer or, or something to that effect, or his kickboxing instructor or something like that. Oh, okay, it's a, cool. it's an, again a personal a personal uh, friend yeah. of, of John. Why not? Why? Well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, um, probably uh, don't have to pay uh, SAG award wages if you're just getting your friends in either. But they probably got a SAG, <laughs> well, got a mean, SAG card out of it and free uh, healthcare or something. Well, hey, SAG isn't cheap to join though. So no. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I think what I liked about the choreography in this fight scene, because there's really, there's no guns, um, no. they're not even really knives. Um, it's very, it, it's not quick cutty like you see in modern, in, in like modern action movies where it's just the camera's kind of all over the place, really close up. There's close ups, but it's more of a, it, it's more of a grapple. 
because yeah, you watch they, a lot of martial arts movies and you're just like, why didn't they like, why didn't somebody just tackle the guy and get him to the ground? Mm. Well, he does like yeah. they're on the ground and they're just literally just kind of grappling, grappling and kind of grabbing each other and pushing on each other to, to kind of get leverage. Yeah. They're, they're, it's a great mix. Oh, of, real. Um, yeah. It's, it's, a, it is a great mix of like um, standard movie fight choreography and then just like uh, scrapping to survive sort of fight choreography and it, it does mix in well and yeah the, and and it comes back that um the the weapon he uses is the the pen that the lawyer gave him at the start of the reunion and uh it is, <laughs> yeah it is, it's ken's pen <laughs> it's a it's a great um just a, a, a great little callback and um what is because Ken's great because he's given this pen and when he gives the pen to people he's like oh let me give you the car a card oh no wait you're special I'm gonna give you a pen mm -hmm. and then like later like Jeremy Fiven's character Paul says hey did you get a pen from from Ken mm -hmm. like he's giving pens to everybody obviously yeah. but then yeah that's the pen he uses to like and he jabs it in uh, Felix's yeah. neck and he thanks him he thanks him later he's like oh thank you yeah. for the pen thanks for the pen he's like oh yeah, yeah. no problem. <laughs> But yeah, that's and that's when sort of it, it sort of unravels a bit for Martin, like um, uh, Debbie. Yeah, it uh, all comes to uh, a head. Yeah. yeah, Debbie finds him. Uh, I think it's yeah the thumb the thumbnail for this video. Uh, Debbie finds him, and he's sort of just sort of like leaning over the the guy with the pen after he's just stabbed him, and it's sort of um, she because he's been telling everyone the whole time he's a professional killer. This is what he does, but no one has believed him, and. Mm -hmm. The penny drops, and she's like, "Oh, he was telling the truth, and this is the reality of it." And so she freaks out, runs away, and Jeremy Piven is there, and he um, he helps him uh, conceal it all, and they have to um, sort of uh, get rid of all the evidence and make it look like nothing happened. And and it's it's the movie sort of takes a bit more of a turn as well. Yeah, but be before we move on from that scene, I want to say, like. If you can find a friend like Jeremy Piven in your life, like oh, yeah. character in this movie, like this is the guy that, that, that you want. Because like, so Debbie's running down the stairs. She's screaming in a panic and like mm -hmm. wants to get out of there. He tries to like grab her and say like, what's going on? What's going on? Where's my boy? Or where's our boy? Mm -hmm. And she's screaming, runs down, breaks away from him, runs down the stairs. Jeremy beelines it up the stairs. Mm. Like, she's obviously freaked out, but he's like, I got to go see what's going on. My friend might be in trouble. He goes up there and, yeah, see, sees, obviously, the aftermath of it and basically just, like, helps get rid of the body. Yeah. Like, that's the friend you want. Like, the yeah. guy who will just kind of rush up the stairs to help you while somebody else is running away in, in just abject horror at what they saw. He runs he runs the, to the to the trouble and then helps you bury the body. Like, what a, what a, what a man. Yeah. And as as this as this um, scene's happening and, and it's all going on, uh, 99 Red Balloons is playing. The and German version, which was great. They didn't play the yeah. American. Because the German version, and I'm not like an elitist or anything like that, but the German lyrics sound so much better in, for yeah. that song than the Absolutely. American lyrics. So, yeah. And I, that's, I love that song, too. And it's and it just it's another it fit the scene perfectly the energy of the song mm -hmm. like the tempo of everything they're doing it was yep. it's just another perfect um, song selection for this movie and, mm -hmm. um, absolutely and then and then you get the little scene of um, uh, Paul and um, uh, Cusack and Jeremy Piven uh, talking again and he sort of introduces him he goes Paul uh, Paul Spiricky, um, you know uh, yeah Spiricky. Yeah. yeah real estate or something and then he's like what do you do. And he, because he's already told him like multiple times what yeah. he does, so he just he doesn't say anything. He just looks at him, and then like he sort of realizes, okay, this is this guy. He, my friend, has he's gone to a dark place, but he's sort of he's still there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just, and then um, he's like, well, what now? Chase the girl. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you do, and you do like well, he doesn't. She ends up coming to uh, him at his hotel or motel or whatever a little bit later yeah, that and night. I, I, I guess maybe that's a little bit of a subversion. Maybe I don't know if it's a subversion, but it's a little bit of a reversal of the trope. So typically in the romantic comedy movie, the dude fucks up and then he has to make some grand overture to get the girl back. Mm. 
And he doesn't. He's just kind of like, all right, I'm going to go back to my hotel. I'm, I, I still have a job to do. I'm going to get ready for to do that. This is yeah. like, th- like, there's no way she's going to come around. Yeah. And he, yeah, and, he still does have the, the job looming over his head of uh, mm-hmm. what he's got to do coming up. But he doesn't know who the target is yet, which is another sort of... No, because um, he's just been putting it off because he's been so kind of entangled and, and reconnecting with everybody from his former yeah. life. Yeah, which I think they do really well. Like, they sort of... Like, you know the job's there, but um, you're not always thinking about, oh, he's still got this job to do because they do a really good job of, um, like, sort of distracting you with the actual, um, not plot, but, like, the sort of yeah. um, the character development of the movie. The only time you're really reminded of it is is when um, his assistant, when they're on the phone, and she's kind of like, well, the job's a good thing the job's done. The job's done, right? And he's like, I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. And that's really your only kind of reminder as, as the movie goes on. Yeah, because uh, killing the assassin that's after him, it kind of, um, it sort of marked him again as well. Like the, the, the heat <laughs> might intensify as well. So you better get this done and get out of there. Otherwise, you probably won't have a chance to do it again. Or And also, we haven't really talked about him, but um, sort of uh, looming over um, the whole movie and Martin is uh, Dan Aykroyd's uh, grocer who's another assassin, Mm -hmm. who's um, sort of obsessed with starting this assassin's union guild. Guild thing, thing. yeah. Yeah, where everyone gets like, uh, what do you say, medical and and healthcare and dental and everything and uh, no meetings. God, like, yeah. The first, the the first scene where the two are face to face, um, they meet up, he like drives up and, they're yeah, talking. Just after the original, they're, 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 um, yeah, they're very skittish around each other. They're always kind of like jumpy and everything. Like, uh, yeah, worried. About I love that. One of them trying to shoot. Him. Yeah, it, it's great. I, the scene in the restaurant with the omelet and everything is great too. Yes. Um, yeah. But and the whole approach to each other. How it, like, yeah. They yeah. They how they're so it. like yeah, they're so jittery around each other mm. and trying to like angle for like the upper edge or whatever. Because yeah. they it, both it, know it's, that like it's really you fun. Could shoot me if I turn my back. He'll he'll shoot yeah. me like almost immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a great and, dynamic. And it's a great dynamic, and he, he mentioned he's he's putting together the guild, and he's like, well, you know, they're they're getting us so cheaper now since the fall of the the the, the Soviet Union. And he's like, yeah, the market's been flooded. They're getting us and like they're talking about it like it's like their trade is just some generic commodity. Yeah, and it's it's just kind of like business, like oh yeah, yeah, the market's flooded. All these all these. These former East East Soviet bloc assassins are now on the market, and they're ruining our gig. And you know, so we, we need to make a union to to protect our our prices and, and things like yeah. that. It's just it, it it's it, it's a funny angle. And yeah, he's obsessed yeah. with this thing because he doesn't like the competition or the the oversights or, or, or things like that. Yeah, but he's he's really um he's sort of uh he's sort of playing the grocery snake. Yeah, because yeah. he's the one that calls the the government guys, and basically rats out Martin and some Martin yeah. and tells him that he's he's in Detroit to do a job. Yeah, and so that that's where the two government the guys, yeah, that was originally Grocer's. So Grocer's like upset that 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 Martin got the job instead of him, and so he sends these he he plays informant to these two NSA goons, who's Hank Azaria, and I I don't know the other actor's name. Um. But they're the ones that are like driving around together in a station wagon. Like, oh, that's not conspicuous at all. Um, like Martin spots him right away as he starts to tail him. He's like, he knows what's up. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the whole that's the whole dynamic of Grocer, is that like he he's like the enemy of the enemy, but then kind of also want to be father figure to to Martin. Kind of, yeah. and Martin rejects it's, that idea entirely. It's He's a, like, it's a very I don't strange, want that. That's not what I'm looking for. Yeah, it's yeah. a very strange relationship that the two have. Mm-hmm. Spe- like, because you, it is like he's he's constantly like he's he's looking after him and like nurturing him, but then he's constantly trying to kill him and like get him killed, just yep. for um like to get rid of competition and everything. It, it's a very very strange um relationship, but it is one of my um favorite roles of Dan Aykroyd. Like he. And it's it's a very different role to a lot of the things he usually does. I think 
It's a, he's yeah, a very, he doesn't play like a whole lot of bad guys. <laughs> so no. that's, that, that's unique. And sort of manic people like that, like the, the guy, like he's like bing, bing, bang, bing, bing, bang, popcorn. And like he's, he's yeah. got all these sort of weird mannerisms and tics and things. Like he has been um, like doing this for a long time and he's sort of like just sort of checked out. A Yo, yeah, he, he, yeah, when they're eating breakfast or whatever at that, the diner with the omelets and stuff like that, he's like, here, try these. He's, this, is the, this, is the, this, is, this makes Prozac like look like nothing. It's like Durzac yeah. or whatever he calls it. And he's like, and he's like, I don't like, you keep it. I don't do that stuff. He's like, I don't do it. I ingest it based on, like, uh, based on instructions from my neurophysiologist. Yeah, I, I resent the fact that you you say that I, I'm doing these drugs and they're basically yeah. Like drugs. <laughs> yeah, it, there is. It's so many great little, uh, just great little um, character things like that that they put yeah. in. Yeah, and the, and there's a callback later, like when they're in the van trying to kill their final target. He's like offering the Durazac to his team members, mm. like Durazac, and they're like, "Oh yeah," and they have one. Yeah. You know, it's like like they're eating them like Tic Tacs. Yeah. <laughs> and that um, and yeah, all throughout the movie, he's sort of he's always sort of there, like watching over Martin from a distance, mm -hmm. um, and sort of keeping tabs on him and everything. And then, like right up until the end, where uh, Martin realizes um, uh, who the job is, and yeah. Spoiler they both, alert. <laughs> yeah. They both sort of go after the target um, from the beginning, uh, from the mm -hmm. um, from different angles. And you see that the setup where the, um, well, oh, yeah, um, uh, it, this is a spoiler review, uh, spoiler talk anyway. So it's it's Debbie's Yeah, yeah. We the, can say, yeah, it's Debbie's <laughs> um, But yeah, and, and you see that uh, he's he's running up the, the street and Gross is there in the van and he's lining up the shot and then Martin comes in in the car uh, cuts him off and sort of uh, jump in and, and sort of saves his life, takes him back to the house, and it's it's and it's an ac it's an action climax to the movie, but it also has so much uh, character moments and character development and plot development as the action is happening that it's um, mm -hmm. it it doesn't make it it never makes it boring like rewatching the the end scene I don't think because there are no there's a there's a great, great line exchange in that moment when he rescues the dad. And he's like, Martin says to his dad is either like, either I have a new a newfound respect for life or I'm in love with your daughter. Yeah. And then it cuts to <laughs> Grocer in the van pursuing him. And he's yeah. like, <laughs> like, this guy either has a newfound respect for life or he's in love with his daughter. And like, he repeats, yeah. the, he repeats the same line it, like verbatim. But yeah. it was just kind of funny having him juxtaposed like that as yeah, it, as this car chase is going on because he's taking him back to his house where they're going to kind of make the last stand against Grocer and his guys and like Grocer's pursuing him right behind. Absolutely, and and, and it is um it's a great last stand for the movie, and it because it yeah uh, there's 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 like good action scenes, but there's also um uh, a lot of. Uh, cutting back and forwards between Martin and he keeps going up to check on um, where well, he's yeah, in the bathroom. Through, yeah. yeah. He's moving them through different parts of the house to keep them safe. And finally he gets them up to the bathroom and locks them in there with, um, with a gun. And, but he keeps mm -hmm. coming back to check and, and, and Debbie's just there and she's like, she's hands in the gun. She just says, make this work. And like, so he's, exp he's like talking to her like about, uh, I think that's when he tells her about how he had the epiphany of, walking over the gym. That was before they got to the bathroom. They were downstairs oh, okay. at that point yeah. yet. But and he's like, you know, I think he's like, you know, I'm in love with you. Like, you don't have to answer me now, but will you marry yeah. me? And, and that's just like, make this work. Yeah. And then closes the door and he goes off and takes out a couple more guys. Yeah. And then he comes back and like, she's still pointing the gun at him and he's just like, oh. but, um, yeah. yeah. And, and you get the, um, the, the bit where, um, the, who I think they kind of just, I mean, they serve their purpose, but they sort of just, um, just, I think it's just like a, a common movie thing. Like, you know, just kill or kill off the characters. If um, you get to the end of the movie and you, and you don't have anything to do with them. And it's the two um, government agents. <laughs> the NSA goons. I love yeah. the way they died, actually. Exactly. It, Cause it's, um, it's, it's, it's poetic cut between the, um, Martin and Grocer, who have been like sort of pursuing each other through the house, shooting uh, through walls and over counters and all these different things, 
and they both ended up at um, one side of the um, uh, kitchen counter each. And yeah, there's like a half wall between the the kitchen and the living room. Yeah, and grocers and, on in the kitchen side, and Martin's on the living room side, but they're like they're behind the full full wall portion of that wall, so they're yeah. hiding from each other. And then boom, in comes to the doors, burst these NSA guys are like NSA, and yeah, you can describe what happens next. Oh yeah, and 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 they come in, and and it's a great little moment because you sort of they're firing at Martin, and he's pretty much um, he's really outgunned because he's like he doesn't have much cover, and he's sort of um, very much uh, at the uh, disadvantage. But then they both start shooting, and you just see Grosser pop up, and he just because he's like a he's just a maniac anyway, and he just starts shooting the uh, NSA agency with this big with a lead. big fucking grin on his face, yeah, too. and um and then Martin starts shooting him as well. And they both pretty much empty their clips, and then they turn at each other again, and then you get the they both um, like click, <laughs> yeah, click click, and then they both duck down again, and then you get this great exchange where like Gross is like, I'll uh, I'll spot you a clip for a hundred G's or something, and goes, oh deal, and like he throws the gun out, and then you see Gross to try and get up, and Martin just hits him with this big TV that's sitting on the thing, which is CRT um, TV, not like exactly. a flat screen. So Martin's probably that, um, that have a charge in him. Stuff. Yeah, so and fine. Martin's probably thankful it was one of those old heavy CRTVs yeah. as well, instead of one of the new LCD ones. Probably just Grosser probably just would have got back up and shot him. But um, yeah, it might have knocked him out, but it wouldn't have killed him. Like this CRT no. TV killed him because, like, you see yeah. Grosser on the floor and his like leg is switching, like he got fried. Yeah, and Martin's all cut his hand up on probably like the edge of the glass when he's he's mm -hmm. broken it on his head, and like he's got to bandage his hand up, and then you see him make his way back up to. Um, Debbie and the father, and that's when he like he opens the door, and like she just points. He's like, he's talking. He's like, I, I, I think I, I think he's like saying, I, I, I love you. I, I think we should get married and and like mm -hmm. get away from here and stuff. And she just sort of points the gun at him and just sort of closes the door. I think, and it's um, it's just a great little um, moment in the movie. And oh, the dad a, has a great line too, though. Oh, yeah, the dad's in the tub and he's like. You have my blessing. <laughs> yeah. And um, he's, um, I think he's, because I think Jenna Elfman's in this, and she was in a show, uh, Dharma and Greg. I think he was the father on this I think Dharma he was the father and... of Greg, I think, wasn't yeah, he? Or, think... No, he was either, because, yeah, because. Yeah, Greg, the, Dharma's, the guy. Yeah. Dharma's parents the were hippies. like hippies. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and that was like the. He he's because he's a very he's, he was he was a good comedic actor. He's got a, a couple of comedic moments, like the first time Martin tells him, um, "A oh, professional killer," and and his his response is, "Oh, that's, I hear it's a growth industry," and then you, yeah, Martin leaves, and you just see him like <laughs> sort of start drinking his drink, and then just quickly downs it, and he's like sort of got this look on his face, like, "Oh shit!" Like he kind of maybe knows, like he might be here for me, kind of thing. I think he like, was uh, the one that he was the one person that he told that like believed him. Absolutely, yeah. At least because yeah, the way, the way he downed the the whole rest of his drink, yeah. and it was like it was a a full glass of whiskey, yeah, yeah, uh, scotch or whatever. But yeah, whatever. But yeah, yeah was, the exchange uh, between him and and Martin when he's goes to pick up Debbie for the the reunion in the first place was great. Absolutely. That that's yeah, and that's what you were talking about where he, he downs the whole drink and he's like. You know, he's like, oh yeah, I figured you went the the hipster route and like, mm. like, like those people I've seen on Newsweek or something like that. And he's like, oh no, went the other direction, six figures, ruthless, cutthroat. Yeah. And you know, it was just it was exactly a, it was another same. one of those kind of like great exchanges that reminded me a little bit of like him and the doctor, or is is uh, Doctor Oatman. Yes, and that was the one thing like sort of the doctor sort of phases out a bit. Um, of the like from basically the reunion onwards, the doctor is sort of he's not really seen again. Oh, like but he gets he gets one hell of like a comeuppance though. For because what? well, because like when before Martin goes to the reunion, he calls Doctor Oatman on the oh, phone, yeah. and Doctor mm -hmm. Oatman has him go through this like breathing exercise. This is me breathing. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 one with the me, and I'm on this adventure, and and. Like, you know, hey, go repeat that for 20 minutes and fuck off is yeah. basically the advice he gave him. 
And so, and then Martin cocks the gun and goes, this is me breathing. And then yeah. goes, to the, goes to pick up Debbie. Um, later, after he gets back from the reunion and he and Debbie had their falling out, he's, he's back at the, he's back at his you know, bread and breakfast or hotel or whatever he's in. Um, and he's on the bed and he calls Dr. Oatman. Yes, I love this scene. And and he he gives him this phone call and he's like, Oh, Dr. Oatman, I, I just I'm like, you know, I, I don't think you're taking this very seriously. You know, I've made a lot of progress and everything, and I don't need um I, I don't think it would be good for us to work together anymore. And I want you to take a deep breath and realize that this is me firing you. Mm. Which of course puts in and, and Dr. and it cuts back to Dr. Oatman, he's like scrambling to like turn off his answering machine so he doesn't hear the message because he's literally having like an out of body like panic attack mm-hmm. over the idea of like I'm fired. What does that mean? He just and he's, he he's also, absolutely the trolls the well. fuck out of him. Yeah, and you think like he's got the patient in there as well who's like mm-hmm. hearing hearing this message mm-hmm. and then he's like trying to disconnect the machine. He ends up just ripping it out and throwing it throwing against it. The yeah. Wall. Oh. <laughs> That is one of the best scenes in the movie. I love it. What a great troll. <laughs> Just yeah. an absolute, like, at no point do you believe that Martin, the character of Martin, is actually going to go and assassinate his former therapist. No. Like, he, he did he that to, to, to deliberately troll him and make yeah. him think that way because he thought that, you know, he, he was giving him bullshit advice and, you know. Yeah. And he says it a few times in the movies. Like, he has... He has <laughs> at least morals and scruples like he they offer him yeah. a um a, a green piece boat to take out and he says no i i have scruples i'm not going to do that and uh um, yeah and he, and he, he says has, you know chances are if i've come to your door you've done something to bring me there like yeah i don't just and assassinate is, anybody yeah and it, it's pretty much true from what we know of the like the people in the movie that he went after like there mm-hmm. was um there was definitely like he 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 describes it like you should see like some of these guys it reads like a demon's resume and yeah like yeah like he, he sort of goes after the not like just normal people just like he goes after the sort of the people that either governments or um like big corporations want gone yeah but, yeah and w- which is kind of funny because like one of the reoccurring kind of gags or jokes or, or, or things that come up in the movie is like how everybody, because this takes place and it's supposed to take place in, in Gross Point, Michigan, right? Yeah. Which is basically a very wealthy suburb of Detroit, right? right in the heart of U.S. automobile manufacturing, mm-hmm. right? And he, he makes repeated, like he, he says, to, I know he says it to Debbie and I know he says it to, to Paul. Like nice car, nobody buys American anymore. Because like yeah. all these people that like got rich on in the automobile industry, like aren't even buying American cars, and he keeps calling that out. Yeah. And so like Debbie's father works for the automobile industry apparently, and the reason he wants they want to assassinate him is he's going to testify about, and he says a line something like, "The design division wants me dead over a leaky sunroof." <laughs> I you know, and it was just kind of like a. Little subtle indictment of the U.S. automotive industry a little bit there. Yeah, like yeah, they were going to assassinate him so he didn't testify about a leaky sunroof that cost the company money. Yeah, yeah, there there is that was the bad shit that was going to get him on on his door. So like, I don't think Martin would have done the the job anyway, but he was in a tough pickle because the reason he had to do the job was because of the snafu um, with the guy that was supposed to be killed in his sleep in Miami, and it's like his it's. It's the second. It's a second kill attack or uh, hit job that you see in the movie, yeah. and neither one goes well because he's no. supposed to. It's supposed to make it. The, the guy's supposed to appear to have died of, of a heart attack, and he's like poisoning him with something to give him a heart attack. And yeah, it's a great setup he, they do for that. Yeah, he, um, he, yeah, with the string. Yeah, yeah. They, it, doesn't um, out, it doesn't work because he turns his head and then the, the poison lands on his cheek and it wakes up the guy he's supposed to assassinate. Mm-hmm. And so obviously, like, the dude knows that he's going to be assassinated. So Martin has to run down the stairs and basically shoot him. And then, yeah. of course, the client is now very upset because it was supposed to look like a heart attack. And now it's clearly an assassination, a murder, Yeah, uh, which is not what the client's paid for. No. And, and so, yeah. 
that's why Martin has to take this other job from the same client is to kind of like, he has to do this one kind of pro bono to yeah. make up for his fuck up on the previous one. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a person that they've done business with a, a lot, apparently. Yeah. They said it's a, a big firm or something. Um, yeah. That they uh, had a lot of uh, uh, past work with. But yeah. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, overall, the, the, like, just, there's so much in this movie. Like, because, yeah, as you said, I, I completely forgot about the, the whole leaky sunroof thing and everything because there is so much, um, so much dialogue and um, little plot um, details layered into the dialogue that they're not like in typical movies where someone will stop and have a big exposition scene. It's very much um, sort of woven into the actual dialogue and um, plotting of the movie which I think is um, a testament to the writer. Yeah. Even when there is something close to exposition, it makes sense from the character's standpoint that's asking the question. Yeah. So it's not like, hi, I'm a character. I'm going to ask this question so the audience gets to hear the answer. It's like, no, I like, you know, Polly, like, where have you been for 10 years? Like, I mean, and that's a reoccurring question. He gives it like 10 years, you know, 10 years you know he, yeah. he does that whole thing and um you know he, he he's like like i freaked out i joined the military and like he give he gives this line and this is and that's just how you start to get the idea of what martin's backstory is like how he yeah. became an assassin and and it, and it was through his friend from high school who he disappeared with and, and like it, it was a logical question for paul to to ask Martin was, yeah, where have you been for 10 years, dude? So, I mean, that's if you're going to do exposition and you're going to feed that information to your audience, that's the way you do it. It's like from the characters, like where, where exposition really stands out as bad is when it's like, but that character should already know that. Why is he asking? Yeah. And they, and they do, oh, it's for my benefit. Yeah. They do a great job of it as well with Debbie because, uh, with, like, sort of her introduction, mm -hmm. a lot of the stuff she's saying, she is saying it as a radio host to, like, a, a, her broadcast audience. So it's yeah. never really like she's, you know, just sitting there saying these things. She's actually doing it for a purpose and it actually fits into the story and the character. And it's just... It's, just, um, it's, it's well blended, I guess, yes. is the best way yeah. to describe it. It's just it's blended in there nicely. It doesn't stand out. It's not intrusive. It just it, it flows, which is one of the real big strengths of the, the writing in this movie and, and the way it was um, executed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very, very, this movie is so under... I, I, I can't believe $30 million. Like, God. I know, and it's... A, a lot of my favorite movies are like that. Like I was the same with uh, Big Trouble yeah. in Little China. It's like they just some of them. Oh yeah, that's like an all time classic of <laughs> example of of a movie that was just like what? It's yeah, just before its time, I guess. Mm. But, yeah, and it, but it's also like it's if if I, I mean I wasn't alive when um, uh, Big Trouble in Little China came out. I don't think. Oh, if I was, I was, I was too young to see it in the theaters. I can yeah, tell you that. I was a, I was a few months old, and um, <laughs> the uh, the marketing for that. If people had a, probably known about that movie, I I don't see how people wouldn't have gone and, and seen it and enjoyed it because it's not like, especially a Big Trouble in Little China. It's not like it's from an unknown or with an unknown. Like it was John Carpenter who had a pretty good. Um, resume before that, and Kurt Russell, who with John Carpenter had a pretty good resume. Well, yeah, I mean, Kurt Russell was a, a teen star. Yeah, you know, it just I, uh, that one. I really don't understand how it, it didn't do well, and and this one, gross point blank. I mean, if I had seen this movie in the theaters, I would have loved it, and I probably would have told everyone about it. And I mean, you know, all the other four people in Australia would have gone and seen it, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah that, that was the thing. It's like when, when you when you factor in box office from movies back then, you you have to understand that the global box office wasn't nearly what it is today. Yeah, like Hollywood's basically 
afloat basically because of the foreign box office, not domestic. Yeah. This this movie did like two million dollars overseas. Yeah, that's I don't understand that. Um, well, I, you know, it was probably on three the you know it was probably played in three theaters like in it was like capital it was probably played like on in one theater in London. Uh, you know, maybe one in Sydney, and if, if Australia at all, yeah. like, and certainly not in China, probably at all. No, um, it was just you know, it was that time because I, I remember a time when a hundred million dollars was like, wow, that's a box. Oh, yeah. I mean, what a that's a huge movie. That would launch franchises. Like, if the first one got a hundred million dollars, that would launch. Right. That was like the that was the threshold. Them. That that yeah, was. They- Today's billion dollar threshold. Yeah, it was they would green light another two, three movies off the back of that, like almost mm-hmm. immediately. Yeah, it's so amazing how different it is now, because oh, yeah. I mean they have to market the shit out of these things. Like, I'd like to That's think that Gross Point thing, Blank, yeah. if it, if it came out today as a brand new movie, nobody's ever seen it before. Like, I want to say that like social media. And things like YouTube probably would have helped it along quite a bit. Yeah. And it would have had better it would have had longer legs. Yeah. It could have made maybe been maybe not like a Sonic, but maybe like a um yeah, like a, a sixty sixty million sixty to seventy mm-hmm. million dollar movie easy. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it's just because it was so low budget they didn't want to stick a lot in the marketing. I, I don't know what caused me to go see it. I, it was probably the fact that I saw that John Cusack was in it. To be honest with you, because I liked, like, I watched all of his movies, pretty much like you know his eighties movies. I'm like, oh yeah, I like John Cusack. We'll see this movie. Yeah. This looks, this looks like a fun movie. Yeah. And I watched that movie, and I was just like, God, I really like this movie. Like, I, you know, it was one of those times you leave the theater, and it's like you got this beaming like grin. Like, like there's movies that are good, but you leave the theater exhausted because it's like an emotional roller coaster. Like war movies for for me are like that. Like. Yep. If it's a good war movie, like, uh, like you saw Black Hawk Down in the movie theaters, and like regardless of whether or not you think that's a good movie, it's a heavy movie to watch. Like that's not a movie like you leave the theater going, I got a ton of energy now because it, like it, it's an emotional roller coaster. Um, yeah. You know, We Were Soldiers or or Saving Private Ryan, tough movies to just you feel drained after you watch them. This movie, I felt like, like. I had a spring in my step. I was like, that was Completely. fun. Yeah. I'm the same. Like, uh, Mystic River. I can, I've watched that, I think, twice. And, like, I can't, I don't even think I'd be able to watch that again. Like, that is a very emotionally draining movie to watch. Mm-hmm. And then you get something like this, and you can almost watch it on repeat. It's just so fun. And so. Well, yeah. I mean, um, it, it ends, it, it ends up, on, you know, with Blister in the Sun, right? Yeah. It's the final song, and they're driving off on the highway. That's clearly not in Michigan, um, no, no, but you know, it, it's, it's very clearly things, yeah. LA. Um, that's one of those things as Australians we yeah. never really pick up on because it's sort of all you go. Yeah, okay, that's that's what Michigan America looks like. Okay, I guess. It, yeah, no, nope, like not LA. even close. <laughs> um, in, in fact, like almost Based the entire movie well. was filmed in LA. Uh, they only like went to to Gross Point to like film some of like the establishing like helicopter shots over the area. It was yeah. It's pretty much all done in LA. But um <laughs> they're leaving and they're basically like they're getting away from it all. Uh you know, he gets the girl on the end and they're going to go live happily ever after and they're just driving off and you know Debbie's kind of voicing over this line. Um, at the end, and it's you know it's the blister in the sun song, and it's just kind of like it was a nice ending. It was like these are the endings. Like like again, pay attention, to Hollywood. Sometimes when we watch movies, we just kind of want to leave on a good note. Yes, we we like I know you think it's all bourgeois and and corny and everything to like have a nice payoff at the end, but your customers kind of like that every now and then. Like not everything has to be this like introspective depressing downer of a movie where you leave the theater and you're just like, Bleh. like, like sometimes, sometimes we, we like it when the guy gets the girl at the end and they live happily ever after. And it looks like they're, they're going off and, and having a nice life now. Um, yeah. That we like that kind of stuff guys. Like it, it's really not that hard. No. 
That was a mall from Michigan. Boy, I no way that was Michigan. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's most certainly. Not. I live in Wisconsin, um, which is you know basically to the the direct west of Michigan um, as right. as far as uh, environment and and climate goes, pretty much the same. Yeah, and yeah, I mean we share we share a big lake called Lake Michigan that's between us, and yeah, that that's not Michigan. Now, granted, Detroit's on the the eastern side of of Michigan, but still. Not that was not Michigan. <laughs> no, I'll um I'll, I'll just put looks beautiful though. Looks beautiful in the chat as well. Of um the uh, this uh, uh screening that uh, is coming up of the movie Ghost Point Blank in Detroit with a um a Q and A with John Cusack after it. Um, I think the tickets were about forty-five to sixty dollars. I think around that range with like VIP ones and everything. But um, if you're in the general area, I mean, that's. I, I think that would be. And if you haven't seen the movie, or if you have and you really like the movie, I think that would be a pretty cool sort of thing to go and see because you can't find a lot of stuff about this movie, and especially about the production. Like it is that, like I was saying before, on the uh, the physical copy we've got here. There's no special features, and it um, actually, if this is what I want to say, if any people from anywhere like Arrow or anywhere ever see this, this movie needs an Arrow release or a or some sort of uh, Shout Factory or some sort of Blu-ray or special edition yeah. 4K with with like a behind the scenes and maybe like a, a director's commentary or an actor's commentary or something. This this movie. Yeah, all those things cost me. money, man. Yeah, I know, but it's like this movie, it's worth it. And it, it, I'm worried that it could, it could fade if it like, doesn't like get a decent, um, physical copy release or anything, because I don't, I don't know how much it sort of streams and stuff over in America, but it's hard to find streaming here. And it, um, it's one of those ones that, you know, I don't. it's very, very rarely included. It's always, you have to rent it. Yeah. And that's, that's what worries me, but it's a great movie um we'll be like pretty much pretty much wrapping up soon but um mm. is there any final like thoughts on the movie or anything that you wanted to say about it greg or yeah don't think like, just talking about endings and ending on a nice note i i will say like i i absolutely adore this movie it is one of my all-time favorites um but i wouldn't call it a perfect film and so if you're going in it and just looking at a logic standpoint there's there's one thing that always kind of sticks out at me um, and that is like, where are the police? <laughs> <laughs> like literally, like you blew up an Ulti Mart, and like nobody's like, in, it, there's like no investigation as to like how how this 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 convenience store like blew up. <laughs> um, and that happens like that happens before the dance and before like, and he's very clearly there. Um, the 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 clerk, he saves the clerk's life, but like. The clerk could easily describe what he looks like and everything like that. Plus, you have two government guys that were like witnessing the whole thing, and they're just like cool. Mm. Now, granted, like I get why they wouldn't report it because they they want they want to catch him in the act. They don't want to catch him as like being a witness or a victim. Yeah. Um, but it it like the second Ultimar scene, I thought should have been cut. Yeah. And it was it was the fight scene. Like I think it would have been better because like my least favorite aspect of the movie is the Felix character. Yeah, okay. Um I mean I do like him at the dance, but like in your mind, cut that scene out. And the only, the next time we see Felix is just when he's in Martin's room looking at his invite, so he knows where he's gonna be. Yeah. And then you just see him show up at the dance to like go take on like the the ultimate scene was basically a scene that was just for a couple yucks and some trailer shots and, and, and some trailer shots and it didn't really like it didn't really serve the story very well at all and hmm. it's the one thing where like it's really hard like i can believe that the dance and the final big shoot up shoot them up sequence were close enough together where like well one they wouldn't have found the body at the dance yet if, no. if they ever do 
Because yeah, again, he says that. like nobody's going to look for him because this guy's an unknown. He's not attached to anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can believe that that one wouldn't have aroused any suspicions, provided that Debbie never went to the police and obviously Polly never went close to the police. Then nobody's ever really going to find it out because nobody's going to take like a blue. Nobody's going to just randomly do like a blue light in the hallway and be like, "Ooh, what, what's this blood spatter?" Yeah. Um. So like I I can buy that, but the Ultimar thing I I can't like. You, you blew up an Ultimart with like a huge chunk of C4 that would have blown up way more than the Ultimart. That was not correct either. That was the one thing I really didn't like about the movie. I think they should have cut that scene because then I could have believed at some point like that they got out of town before the cops really investigated what happened at his dad's house or her dad's house. Yeah. But with the Ultimart thing, I'm like, well, where is where the... F- like, nobody's investigating this stuff at all. <laughs> like... I can guarantee you in your town, if a gas station or convenience store explodes, that's going to be like, there's going to be an investigation and they're going to yeah. be like, ah, yeah, we might want to yeah. look into this. In- interview the clerk that, that managed to leave the store before it blew up. Because like, he's suspect number one, of course. Oh, yeah. Some insurance scam or something. Well, right, because he got out of there. Like, well, how did he know the place was going to blow up? Like, yeah. if it was like a gas leak or something like that. And like, or did... You know, because that would be like the first assumption that it wasn't C four, but like you could clearly figure out that this was not like a gas. Like C four would definitely have like a different footprint. So yeah. I, I didn't. That's my least favorite part of the movie. I, I got to get out there. Like I, I can't say it's a perfect movie. No, nah, um, I, I don't think any movie is damn perfect, good though. But yeah, it's damn good. But it's not airtight. The police missing is is something that sticks out to me. But. You don't sleep. really notice Very it the first time. Town. Yeah, yeah, you don't really notice it until you've probably watched it a few times. Yeah. Because you're so interested in the, all the other things that are going on and the great interactions between these characters. Like, who he meets up with next and, and the... Like, like we just... When he goes and, like... Like, Polly's like, I have to get something off my chest. I'm like, you know, your your house. And he's like, yeah, I've been there. And like, I'm I'm the guy who brokered the deal. And he's like, well, thank you for profiting on my childhood. Yeah. You know, just that just little banter back and forth. It's just like, I just watched it today. And, and those lines still got a chuckle. And I've seen this movie a lot. Yeah. And those lines still get chuckles out of me. Oh, absolutely. Uh, every time um, Bob DiStepolo is trying to read his poem to John uh, Cusack, <laughs> yeah. I start laughing. For a while. Yeah. And then he stops in for a while. That league goes, for a while. <laughs> I'll do some blow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just um, so many little moments like that through the whole movie that just make it so entertaining and so good to watch. Oh, it is every character, like his school teacher. Yeah. You know, they, they have this conversation about, you know, Ethan Frome, Ethan Frome books and, and like, <laughs> how horrible yeah. that was for the curriculum. And they have this like little banter back and forth. And even that, like every character he bumps into on his whole adventure through this, this movie is interesting. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and I, I can't say that for a whole lot of movies where like everyone is just like, and, no. and, it, and none of them really felt awkward. No. Yeah. That's the thing. It, it's, Unless they were supposed to be. Yeah. It's it's one of the it's the movie I think that does it the best where um, he has great interactions with every character and they're not just one sided interactions like right it's one of those it's one of those movies where um, there is a lot of give and take between the characters and the actors and it's it's a really you you like we uh, we've said it a couple of times now but. You would you'd really want to be on that set, sort of watching those takes and watching the the sort of chemistry and everything build. It would be uh, really fun. So, someone. Oh, absolutely. Making of, please. And I I think uh, and I have no proof, just just gut feel. I absolutely think that the the scenes between Martin and Doctor Oatman were the inspiration for the movies. Analyze this and analyze that. Well, I mean, um, Harold Ramis directed those, so um, there's a, a very good chance he would have seen 
the movie with Dan Aykroyd. So, I mean, that yeah, is, maybe. that's well, high, just high the idea of a of a, a psychiatrist interacting with like, okay, in this it was a mob guy instead of a hitman, but really same difference, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And it's, it's very much the same dynamic and relationship. Exactly. Exactly. When that movie came out, I'm like, that's Gross Point Blank. <laughs> Rip it off yeah. Gross Point Blank. And, of course, that one movie did much better because, I mean, it had marketing behind it. And, of course, it was what, Robert De Niro and Billy Crystal. So, I like, that's going to... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that's going to bring some seats in. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things about seats. this is the, um, the director, uh, George Armitage, He's got a very long um, filmography, but it's very it's a very spread out filmography, and it's a very wide ranging filmography where he's he's been actor, producer, screenwriter, director, but it, it yeah it mm -hmm. is over like a um, from like nineteen seventy one to two thousand and four, so it's um, and it's what what was that the the big bounce, um oh yeah that's the one with uh, I think Owen Wilson's in that one. And, um, no, I think it's 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 kind of it's similar in tone to Gross Point Blank, but it's more of a um, uh, it's set in Hawaii, I think, and it's more like a, um, a a caper movie kind of thing with a a bit of a twist ending, like one of those okay. sort of movies. Yeah. yeah, but it's it's not as good as as Gross Point Blank, but it it is very much it feels like it's in the same sort of. Um, in the same sort of vein as it, but uh, any, um, I think we'll uh, pretty much wrap it up here. Um, uh, going to tell everyone where they can find you um, out there, Lost Jedi, or ah, well, yeah, pretty pretty simple. Uh, it is uh, just at Lost Jedi twenty two on Twitter. Also on uh, YouTube, my handle is Lost Jedi twenty two. Um, hey, have you ever seen um, War Incorporated? No, but I've heard about it. I've heard. I haven't seen it either, and I heard that it's like the spiritual. That's what I've heard. Like, too. Sequel to 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 Gross Point Blank. So I'm gonna have to yeah. check that out. Me too. I that's one I've been putting off for a long, long time because I've no, heard I'm a disappointment. Those <laughs> exactly, and. Like, I'm worried that, oh, how much does it actually sort of, you know, does it tie to it at all? Or, you know, is it just like a, a spiritual, like, you know, very along the same sort of lines as the movie? Or He doesn't play the um, same character, so it's not... Good. Because this the character's name in this is Hauser. So. Oh, okay. No, but yeah, but, I, that's that's what I have heard about. For but, a, I mean, a it's while. got John Cusack, Diane Aykroyd, John Cusack are, are all in it, so... Mm. No, I might actually watch that tonight. I'll Ooh, track it got, down and try. It's and got it. Hillary Hillary Duff in it. Mm. Yeah, that's one of the the things as well. I was like, oh, Hillary Duff. Mm. Uh, but Marissa Tomei. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that, that's she's a good one. That cancels a Hillary Duff out. Yeah. <laughs> a, a Marissa Marissa Tomei is worth one and a half. Um, both Duffs Hillary sisters. Duffs. So. Yeah. Both, both <laughs> of the Duffs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, yeah. So, um, I've I've put it down in the description for the video. Uh, uh, Lost Jedi's YouTube page. Um, oh, he's got you. a lot of um, um, like Mandalorian reviews with Tusk and Bob. Uh, they're very funny. If you um like, <laughs> or even if you don't like the show, go back and watch them. They're uh, good fun. And um, well, they're really okay. short. Like it's like yeah. five less than five minutes to to kind of point out some of the silly things in, in each episode. Yeah, that's how I kept, I, I stopped at episode three of season one, so that's how I kept up with the show for the rest <laughs> of the season, so it's uh, it was good fun, so um, I want to thank you for being here, I, was, I really do appreciate it, this was um, extremely fun to chat about this movie, I, I've i just loved this movie since childhood, and it's um, I've never really gotten a chance to talk about it sort of in depth before and I really do appreciate you being here for that, so thank you. Yeah, I, I, I loved being here. Um, you know, obviously, like, you've been a great supporter in, in the, uh, the other channels, Rhinos and, and uh, Jeff's and Tim's. Um, but also, like, yeah, I really love talking about this movie. Now, I do have friends that like this movie as much as, like, in, in real life. Um, 
but it's not like we go back and talk about a movie that came out that we saw like yeah, 20 years I, yeah. ago, you know? That's, yeah, um, you never so, really get the chance to. You never get the chance to, but like on YouTube, it gives you kind of a chance to, to kind of go back and walk through these movies. And we didn't even really walk through it scene by scene. We, we, we covered a lot, but boy, there's like, if you haven't seen this movie, there's, there's a lot we didn't cover. And yeah, I, I kind I, of, because this one is a bit, it's not really lesser known, but it is a, a bit lesser seen. And I, cause I've done mm-hmm. Jurassic Park and Predator so far. Yeah. I didn't want to kind of give all of it away because I think this one, if you haven't seen it and you are watching this, this is definitely one to go back and, and watch. Even if you read the whole script, it's it's still worth watching. Absolutely, because again, it's... great chemistry between these actors on this thing. Like, like if I'm if I'm making if I'm directing a movie, that's what I'm going for. I'm like, I want my I want my actors to have that kind of dynamic. Yeah, between I, that is that's each so other. important. That's so important. Like outside the it sells script. the movie. It, yeah. I mean, it sells the character. It's, it makes you buy in. It can cause you to kind of overlook some of the silly things like Altamar blowing up a C4. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's the, it's the, <laughs> it's everything that's not in like, you know, if you if take it back to Star Wars, R- Rhino, are you out there? Rhino, <laughs> Dra- tracking fobs. Yeah. Hyperspace. Um, hyperspace skipping. Uh, like, like look at the sequel trilogies. Like there's just, there's nothing the, the character development, like I know, I knew more about Martin Blank in twenty minutes of this movie than I know after two seasons about Din Djarin mm. or Ray Palpatine, oh, Skywalker, whatever the fuck, yeah, or, like or or Finn or anything. Like I know more about Martin Blank's character in, in you know fifteen minutes of this movie. Yeah, it's it's so well constructed. So um. Uh, with that, um, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for yeah. being here. Um, my next uh, movies, I might actually do a, a little split episode on in a few days after the weekend, just in honor of uh, Richard Donner. I might be doing a, uh, a Goonies along with uh, Tommy Tricker and the Stamp Traveler, which was the one I was going to be doing last weekend. But I think I might... Um, put them together because they're very similar movies in tu- in tu- <clears throat> in tone and also um they're very they're polar opposites in in production and everything so i, I wanted to have a bit of a, a look at those ones but uh that's the next one and um uh thanks again greg for being here and thanks everyone for stopping by and i'll catch you all next time cheers <laughs>